we produce aerosols or many of us produce aerosols use when breathing, but we really produce many more when we talk, when we shout, when we sing, um, also when we cough or when we sneeze. Um, and what is an aerosol? So we said it's a little ball of the saliva or respiratory fluid. So we are, you know, our cavities are wet with these fluids and they have to come out. So it's, it's when the air comes out, when there are jets of air, for example, in the mouth, they say a P, P, and you can already see that if you have any saliva on your lips, P, that jet of air going over your lip may take some of it and make little balls of aerosol, right? So it's basically that shear force we call, that you have a surface that's wet and there is, the air is going by very quickly and it can pick up a little bit of, of, that, uh, of that liquid and then it can exit in, in, into the air. Now, we, we do know, you know, there is very strong evidence in the pandemic that vocalizations or talking or shouting, whatever, is strongly associated with transmission, right? I mean, there is many outbreaks in choirs. There are dozens, and we wrote a paper in one, but there is used many, many outbreaks. But to my knowledge, there is no outbreaks that I know of in a library or in a movie theater where people are quiet, right? So it's very clear. And, and there is also many outbreaks in bars where people are, are shouting because the music is loud. So it, it's, it's very clear. And I think anyone disputes that. Vocalization increases transmission. And now vocalization results in producing many more aerosols through these mechanisms, right? Sometimes it's your vocal folds, you know, how we, how we generate the noises basically. So the air is rushing out of us and it goes through the surfaces that, that um, that move and that's how we how we make some of the sounds, right? And those surfaces, the vocal folds are wet, basically in, in this saliva and then they, it can, um, some of these can be picked up and come out of an aerosol. There is also other processes in our lungs. Basically we have something that is like, like bubble formation, you know? So we have like a bronchi, which is like a tube and you can think the tube collapses when we exhale and then both sides are wet. So now when it opens up, you have a formation like a bubble, like one of the kids' bubbles, just a film. And then as you open up, that film breaks like the bubble and, and you know, the material that was in that, that bubble surface now is an aerosol and it can come out, right? And, and that fluid could have the virus, right? So there, there are different ways in which, in which we produce aerosols. Now, at the beginning of the pandemic, WHO and other public health agencies said, oh, that's not really a concern. What's of concern is aerosol generating procedures in the hospital, which is like when, when do intubation or, or different procedures in which basically they put oxygen or they, that are pretty aggressive with your respiratory system. So in those cases, we can produce aerosols. That comes from the first SARS. There were some cases, it wasn't very clear, but it's something that again became a little bit of a dogma. They, they, were, they were sure that you could make aerosols in those cases, right? Now, during this pandemic that has been investigated in a lot more detail, and actually what we see is that those procedures actually don't make aerosols. It's not intubation that make aerosols, for example. It, the, when you extubate, so when someone who has been intubated and you remove uh, that system, then you tend to cough, and it's the coughing that makes aerosols, right? So, so, that, so that was also wrong. But it's something, you know, and it was, you know, once aerosol scientists started doing the measurements, it was obvious. But again, this was something that the doctors had concluded based on patterns of transmission with SARS, and it hadn't really been investigated properly, I should say.